So I also want to share with you, this came as a huge surprise to us, and we're extremely thrilled. Our filmmaking duo, Dave and Chella Con um, I didn't even ask you how, Conan? Ah, yes. oh, see? Perfect. So they reached out to us. They are actually family caregivers turned advocates and were so inspired by Chella's mother's journey through dementia. They started All's Notes, and a crash course for caregivers featuring lots of different things, virtual dementia tour, positive approach to care, and private coaching. It's their mission to improve the lives of those in a relationship with dementia, which is something I picked up on this, a relationship with dementia, not just a patient of or a loved one of. So I want to thank you for that. That was huge for me in the conversation that we had together. Um, through the Care Gap training and plant-based education. They've just started production on an Alzheimer's and cannabis documentary. It will be up. I have all of your emails on Eventbrite, and when that's made available to us, I will send it all out to you so that you know where to find the links so that that information is there. So you might get caught on camera, you might not. Um, it is posted if that's a problem. Um, I guess I just need to ask you to stay out of line of the camera site. Here's where I want to just get away from the details. That's enough of the admin. Two major sponsors, Nina Arbor of Hospice Services of St. Joseph Health and Julianne Sukalis of Home Instead Senior Care, along with an enthusiastic support of our extended sponsors and product vendors who you'll have plenty of opportunity to visit midday. They've once again made this symposium available at no cost. I just have to remind everybody that we are here because of them. Their collective sense is that the information is much too important and no one should be denied the opportunity for the information because of cost. That's where it starts, it's grassroots. So during lunch, we want to, you to visit our sponsors. Of course, uh, Hillsburg S Senior Living, Tony will be up here in the front. Legacy Concierge, Sunrise Villas, which is an Alzheimer's and memory care facility, assisted living up in Santa Rosa. Exceptional Care Homes is our representation for board and care. Mercy Wellness, they're, they are gonna fill our day with so much information. Care by Design is over here against the wall. Plexus is over here on this wall. Plus products, Papa Barkley, Sweet Relief, you can find them all. Our keynote speakers are a wealth of compassion and knowledge and an hour is not enough time for each of them to cover all of the topics on dementia and Alzheimer's. So I've given you a bio of every single one of them and their contact information is in your packets, and every single one of them will tell you that they will make available to you all of their information. I've never known doctors to just be so free with the information, it's so critical. So I wanna start our day with opening comments from Julianne. Most welcomed guests, thank you for being here present with us today. I want to thank you for being here to support yourself, your loved ones, and for the patients that you care for. Thank you for supporting St. Joseph's Health and Hospice and Home Instead Senior Care by being here today. I really want to thank you for supporting the education for medical cannabis. It's time. Who here was present with us in September for Medical Cannabis 1.0? Oh, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for being with us again today. It's very exciting. Uh, let me share with you briefly the genesis of how this symposium began last year. So at Home Instead, we provide home care wherever you call home. We were caring for a patient, Peggy, who lived in a lovely memory care community but they could not control her anxiety and her behaviors and they needed some help one-on-one -on -one with her. So Home Instead was chosen to be the care providers. We came in there and I was talking with the husband and visiting with him and Peggy there and uh, I could see he was really distressed and I said, share with me, what's going on? Why do I see this anticipatory grief on you? You, you know, this should be a good time, you know, to, to have respite for yourself, and we're here to support you. What can we do to support you? What is troubling you? And he said, Peggy is just not Peggy anymore. And it's more than it's just the disease. I think it's all the medication she's on. She was on Seroquel, she was on Haldorol, she was 
basically sedated. And he was so crushed and heartbroken at this. And I thought to myself, well, I just read this article. Hey, would you consider if I mailed you this article about cannabis and dementia? It's kind of a new concept, but I really think you should explore this option that's available. So I sent him the information, and then about seven, eight weeks later, I went back to visit him. And as I walked into uh, the locked community, I turn around, and his eyes met mine across the hall. He comes running down, this cute little 80-year-old gentleman. He was so enthralled. He was so excited. And I said, what are, you so, what are you so excited about? How are you? And he said, <gasps> and he envelopes me in a hug. You know, the kind your Nana used to give you, right? You come for a visit. He envelopes me, and then he peels himself off me, and he looks right at me, and he said, I have my Peggy back. I said, what do you, what do you mean? What do you, what, tell me, what's happening? And he said, of course, she's not all the way back, but what I do have is a part of Peggy back. She's not sedated. She's engaged. She has a quality of life, and she's participating in her own life now. I said, what do you attribute this to? He says to me, it's medical cannabis. You were right. I read the article. I got in touch with the people that I needed to, and now we took her off. A lot of these compounded drugs from Big Pharma, and now we have her on medical cannabis. It has changed Peggy's life. It's changed my life. I was so happy, and I thought, God, we're on to something. You know, I need, to, I need to educate myself more. I need to learn more about this. So I thought, hey, I'm going to call my dear friend Nina. I said, Nina, can I come over? Can we have lunch? Can we chat? I want to talk to you about this medical cannabis. What do you know about it? She says, we're starting to use it at hospice. I said, oh my gosh, let's put it, a brainstorm together. We sat down, we talked, we shared ideas and the concept of building a symposium and educating people. It's time for us to learn more and to share what we know. So last year we did Medical Cannabis 1.0, and now here today, we're here for 2.0. So I thank you for being here. Thank you all for taking the time, and I hope you enjoy this day. So I, let's get it started. Let's get this party started. Dr. Hergen rather began his medical career as a general practitioner in 1976. His practice included general medicine, OBGYN, pediatrics, pediatrics, neonatal care, and emergency medicine. After 25 years in emergency medicine, he began his medical practice in cannabis consultations and general medicine consultations in 1999. He provides cannabis recommendations to Californians with serious medical conditions and consultations worldwide by phone and online appointments. I think last year he was in town by two hours from Australia. He's been a founding member of the Society of Clinicians, Cannabis Clinicians, which is really hard to say that five times. He's got a table of other information up here that you're welcome to come and chat with him for the time that he's with us. I actually believe you're the current president, are you not? There we go, another recognition. So SCC provides clinical cannabis education to physicians and allied health professionals on their website and at conferences and quarterly membership meetings and so on. If you, ha if you, you have a copy of their publication or the O'Shaughnessy's publication in your swag bag. After last year's seminar, I sat with Dr. Hagen, uh, Hergen rather personally in a personal appointment with my sister who flew out from Atlanta where can medical cannabis is not legal. And I listened to her recant her six years of metastatic stage four breast cancer, and I'm happy to tell you that she is still here. His compassion, his understanding, his knowledge and confidence in the application of the medical cannabis convinced me that I needed to continue on this path of education with Julianne and Nina thus this day. So, Dr. Hergenrather, I'm going to give you 60 minutes, and I'm going to let you know at five. <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll start on the mic here. And, and then we'll turn this one on for you. And as you start to move along, get warmed up. All right. Good morning. Uh, 
And thank you for the introduction. It's really quite an honor for me to be here among you, my community. I've been practicing uh, medicine in Sonoma County since 1983, and I was kind of uh, outed a bit when I started my cannabis practice in 1999. Of course, the law changed in 96, and we've had legal uh, medical use of cannabis since, since that time. And I was a bit stunned to find that my colleagues in, in medicine were not into it. They didn't, had never been trained in it, they don't understand it, they think it's a drug of abuse and so forth. So it was, uh, it was a bit of a, a slog getting to this point, but it's really, we've all felt the change over the last few years and, and I, I so welcome it and I think uh, your participation in this is critical to the evolution of cannabis coming into really its maturing as a medicine here in the United States and worldwide. Uh, I'm going to be looking over my shoulder a bit. I don't have a monitor to look at, so you might see the back of my head a little bit, but uh, I want to cover some basic information about approaching patients with uh, dementia. And I think that was in the initial slide. That Yeah, there we go. So uh, as was already said, I am a general practitioner in Sonoma County, my office is in, in Sebastopol. I'm doing consultations a couple days a week. Uh, it really has extended to worldwide as far as how I'm communicating because a lot of people feel like if they can just get a direction with a treatment plan, I may be talking to them in Australia or Eastern Europe or, or anywhere really in the world. So it works on Skype and on phone calls to be able to help people direct them to cannabis as medicine. So, and I have no uh, financial relationships to disclose. As many companies have come my way to say, we need you on, your, on the board, you can have some stock and so forth. I've kind of pushed off on that up to this point. Uh, granted, that's where the money is, but uh, my practice is more important to me to keep it where I'm neutral in terms of product and I, I can respect and, and point people to any products that are good and not feel uh, that I'm tied to any particular product line. Just, uh, so to start, we all, we're all here because of dementia today as, and elder care in general. And Alzheimer's disease is, is irreversible. Granted, people show benefit and improvement when they're using cannabis, but uh, whether or not we can see long-term effects in stopping, or stopping the progression of the disease or even reversing it, this is unknown yet, and there's some interesting basic science around neuro, neuro regeneration, but um, beyond the scope of the talk today. I think uh, a year or two ago, there were supposedly about 5.1 million Americans suffering from Alzheimer's dementia in the United States. These numbers have, have uh, become staggering when you look at it worldwide and see what the progression of this disease is. We do know that the pathology basically is about these proteins, amyloid beta protein deposition, forming what they're called dimers and oligomers, oligomers uh, protein aggregates of the tau proteins, the neurofibrillary tangles around the, the neurons to where they don't work any longer, and that impairs um, neurotransmission and so many functions that um, if you know anybody with dementia, you understand well what I'm talking about. So humans facing uh, this epidemic of dementia and Alzheimer's dementia, with the numbers estimated now at about 47 million worldwide and uh, projected to 131 million people by 2050. These are huge numbers. So what's going on? We have this epidemic of dementia happening in our society. Uh, Alzheimer's accounts for 60 to 70 percent of the cases of dementia, followed by vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, Parkinson's di disease dementia, and frontotemporal dementia. There are other causes of dementia, but this, these are the main ones that we kind of lump together as dementias, and Alzheimer's being the greatest of them. Here's a map that is showing some of the worldwide distribution. So you can see with the darkening of the, um, of the spots, the reds, the orange, the 
kind of the gold and the yellow and so forth. This is worldwide. So whatever we're doing to ourselves, it's not just isolated to the developing countries or to the highly industrialized countries. It's all over the world. So something we are doing is really affecting our brains. There are multiple factors that contribute to the etiology. Certainly it's said that aging is, is significant and is one of those components. Genetics, I'll speak a little bit more to this in a minute, but I'm sure we have some genetic component to, as to whether or not we are more prone to develop dementia as our life goes along. Head injuries, the traumatic brain injuries, and the encephalopathy that we talk about with athletes banging their heads. This is another uh, element for causing dementia and exposure to certain chemicals and compounds. And I, I think we underestimate this. Uh, we tend to overlook it because it gets so complicated so very quickly. This is a list from a paper that came out in 2015 of some of those toxic elements and, and compounds that are actually known to cause dementia changes in experimental animals. So if you, tr if you expose them to any of these elements on the left-hand column or any of these other uh, chemicals, the PCBs, are, they're worldwide. The dioxins are worldwide. The, you know, so many of these products, compounds, are really seen all around the world at this point. It's not just isolated to particular communities where, where they may be manufactured. So this is a big problem and a growing problem. Something that I would wish that healthcare practitioners were more active in, uh, in speaking up for the need to control these, this chemical pollution that we're exposed to. This should be a role of physicians and for that matter nurses. Nurses are such great advocates. We need to be looking at these poisons and trying to to curb and limit and really stop the, the uh, exposure to our population of these chemicals. Of course, we have different forms of dementia. The mild form is something most of us can kind of live with. It, people with dementia, varying degrees of it, do, do pretty well at home. But as you see this list, memory worsens, problems including getting lost, difficulty handling money. So many of the elderly people with dementia are really are really prone to being worked by people after money, either for good causes or for their own personal gains. So a lot of times in dementia, you just don't make good judgments, financial judgments. And this is a problem where uh, families often, you know, take the checkbook away from mom or dad because they just aren't being responsible any longer. So normal tasks take longer, poor judgment, repetitive questions, and so forth, very, very common. By the time we get to the moderate form of dementia, now the confusion worsens and difficulty recognizing family and friends. This is when it's really a much more serious problem and to the point that be, the families begin to get to the point where they say, it's getting really difficult to manage this person with dementia at home. We love to try to manage it at home as best we can, but there is a point, kind of a breaking point, where the family simply can't deal with it any longer. The severe forms of dementia, everything has to be taken care of by somebody else. The patient is often uh, not communicating verbally at all, or at least in, in sensible form. The, um, the hygiene becomes a much greater problem. They don't, uh, the patients don't recognize people, even their closest family, and they're quite confused most of the time. So they no longer communicate, and basically they complete, their care needs to be completely cared for by other people. So here's what it looks like if we take a slice of the brain, a healthy brain on the left and a, a dementia brain on the right, as these Fibrillary, fibrillary tangles form and cause the brain to basically scar and shrink down. It loses its ability to, to uh, reason and, and deal with many, many tasks because the brain is just not there anymore. There are some drugs that we say are designed to treat Alzheimer's disease, but you may very well know that these don't have a particularly good track record. The top four are acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. This is an enzyme 
that breaks down acetylcholine, and if we can inhibit that, then acetylcholine builds up and has a beneficial effect on the brain. There's also Namenda here down below, and this is another drug that is supposedly good. These drugs can, can only alleviate symptoms and may slightly delay progression. That's a may. They should not be prescribed to every patient because the, the benefits are modest, and in some patients, they show no benefit at all, uh, and they do carry all kinds of adverse effects as well. This has been noted over 10 years ago, and I think it's still true today. Dr. Grove may have some update on that as we go along, but these drugs don't have a very good track record at being able to, to slow or prevent the progression of this particular problem. So there are a lot of other chemicals commonly used in treating dementia, and you're all aware of these because they're problematic. We use uh, the antidepressants, the anxiolytics, the antipsychotics, the anti-epileptic drugs, the sleep meds, the pain meds. These are often used to try to control the bad behaviors that are typical of Alzheimer's dementia. And sadly, they don't work very well. There's a tendency to simply increase the dose of these drugs uh, for the agitated behaviors, simply because there are no drugs that are approved for agitation in the United States or worldwide. We don't have drugs for that. Cannabis happens to work rather or quite well for it. So some of the drugs that are typical and have black box warnings on the package inserts are these listed here, Ambien, Lunesta, Sonata. We're just in, uh, up, you know, uh, included among the black box warning drugs. These are in common usage, but as we get to bigger and bigger doses of these to quiet people down, as well as the antipsychotics, uh, antidepressants, and anti more antipsychotics over here, uh, and more antidepressants at the bottom of the list, these are drugs that have this black box warning. And what that means is there is an increased mortality in elderly people using these drugs. And this is kind of the way I happened into this with Dr. Grobe over at Primrose here in Santa Rosa. Is the, the staff and the owners of this facility appreciated that people were dying under the influence of these drugs, trying to get control of their behavior. And it was so heart-wrenching for not only the, the staff and the families, but also the, the owners of the facility itself, they said, we got to do something different. And because there had been good experiences with cannabis, they began to really open it up to uh, having more and more of their patients uh, recommended cannabis and then treated with cannabis by way of their staff. And it has worked very well. So what about the cannabinoids for dementia? This is really more the topic today. There is a scientific basis for this. And it really began, in my opinion, about 20 years ago in this paper that came out looking at a single molecule um, that looks like THC, and they were giving it to patients in a nursing facility up in the Boston area. And what they noticed, what, what they were really looking for was stimulating the appetite and improving body weight. And they gave it to patients, and they found, yep, if they were on dronabinol, they did have a little increase in their appetite and their body weight was up. But more importantly, they noted that when treating with dronabinol, it, it decreased the severity of the disturbed behaviors. And this is really what we were seeing in terms of uh, my own experience dating back 40 years now is elderly people finding that it was very helpful for agitation, for insomnia, for pain, for anxiety for many of the problems that, that come with aging. And I might mention here that when we talk about the endocannabinoid system, and this was covered quite a lot in our Cannabis One talk last year, there, there really seems to be a, re, a gradual deterioration of our endocannabinoid system, this system that brings us back home, that is all about homeostasis. And what we see in, in uh, animal models, which I'll show you in a minute, there's a decrease in our natural cannabinoids as we age. And so this fits well with the fact that people that were not anxious and depressed and agitated in, in the prime of their life, as they get older, then they begin to show these 
problems that are really what I think are endocannabinoid deficiencies as we get increasing anxiety. It can be terrifying, in fact, for people to start getting anxious where they had never been anxious before. They don't understand it. They think, well, maybe it's my blood pressure, maybe it's this or that. But in fact, they do get more anxious and they do get more agitated. And this is a common finding in people aging. So we look to cannabis as a way to calm that and to augment the natural endocannabinoid system so that it works better and kind of wards off the, the evolution of some of these uh, senility changes. Then Lisa Eubanks in, uh, at Scripps in Southern California uh, in a paper about 13 years ago now showed that when she compared THC as a single molecule to those drugs that I showed the list of before, these anticholinesterase inhibitors, THC compared to currently approved drugs prescribed for treatment of Alzheimer's disease, THC is considerably superior inhibitor of this amyloid beta aggregation, this formation of these, these uh, abnormal uh, proteins in the cells that damage the brain. So THC works better than the drugs. And this she pointed out 13 years ago. Going on to a paper that came out actually in 2017, this is a bit off topic, but we're looking at mice. Because the question was, well, the, the news in the media is that, oh, cannabis causes cognitive changes, damages the brain. It's, it's suggested that cannabis damages the brain. Well, what's really going on is pharmacologic effects of cannabis. It calms the nervous system. And it, it will have an effect on, on short-term memory during the, during the phase that you're under the influence of the active drug. So we use it therapeutically. I mean, if somebody has PTSD, what they need more than anything is to not dwell on their past experiences, to calm them, to reduce their anxiety. So there are pharmacologic effects of cannabinoids that are very, very useful. In the case of old mice, they wanted to test and see, well, is there really damage to the brain in these mice? So they treated the mice uh, with cannabinoids, to, with THC specifically, to see what happened over their lives. Now, a young mouse has got a real active brain, and as mice age and get to be a year or a year and a half old, we see that their natural cannabinoids are, are failing, and they don't produce as much, and they show changes that are really a dementia or a, an aging in the, in the mouse's brain. But the, the mice that got these in, injections of THC, I'm sorry, is it oral or injected? I don't remember, I'd have to check. Anyway, these mice that were a year old to a year and a half old, given THC on a daily basis, did not show that deterioration and their brain activity was comparable to two month old mice, youthful mice. And so the evidence really supported the idea that the THC was protecting the brain, not harming the brain. And really, honestly, this is what I would have to say in clinical practice as well. It does have that effect. Moving on to a neurology paper that came out in 2015 uh, out of uh, the Netherlands. The idea here was that they have a lot of neuropsychiatric symptoms in patients. They were comparing THC and placebo, but what they did is they chose a very, very low dose of THC as a single molecule to treat these patients. One and a half milligrams of THC three times a day. I'll show you in a, in a few minutes. We use a much bigger dose than that when we're treating patients with dementia. It might be five milligrams of THC. It might be 10. It might be 20 milligrams at a dose. So we go up on dose in order to achieve an effect. But at a milligram and a half per dose, they didn't see changes that looked like it was benefiting the patient. And in their conclusion, they say that four and a half milligrams of THC per day showed no benefit, but it was well tolerated. And the authors said this should uh, be evidence that we might try higher doses of THC in the future in another study. So that has not been done per se. 
in another paper that came out uh, also just la uh, two years ago now, cannabinoids in treating dementia, they too were looking at the, uh, the findings of a, of a variety of papers that have come out. And when we're looking at open label tests or we're looking at case reports, there are a lot of excellent reports about how cannabis has been useful and has benefited the patients. But if we're looking at the randomized controlled trials that are allowed by the government, we're not seeing it. So what's going on here? This is kind of like circling the wagons when it comes to our federal government. If there are good reports about cannabis, they're gonna try to come out and fund research that will show the opposite. That's just the reality of what we're dealing with in this country. So we're not seeing benefits because we're not really doing the clinical trials that we would hope to do. We're giving minuscule doses of THC. We're giving single molecules rather than whole plant extracts. And in the few tests that have been done, we're not seeing the benefits we would expect because we're kind of rigging it with the kinds of tests that we're allowing to be done. This is true just across the board. In general, in looking at brain damage in adolescent smoking pot, there's a lot of evidence that has come out for about a decade saying that Smoking pot as an, adolescent, adol, ad, in, as an adolescent definitely damaged the brain. We see the brain structures are not the same in those youth. Well, a year later, somebody reviewing that paper noticed that, well, actually it wasn't a year later, immediately it was recognized that those youth that were smoking cannabis were also youth that were using more alcohol in these, in these studies. And so when they controlled for the alcohol and repeated the study, this goes from the Gilman study of 2014 to the Weiland study of 2015. Weiland controlled for alcohol very rigidly. She d doubled the number of subjects smoking pot as well as added adults to it and analyzed the brains. And when they did that, when they controlled for alcohol, there was no damage to the brain structures. So the ads, the, the newspaper articles, the, the uh, assertions of harm continue to come out saying smoking pot damages the brain. It's in the literature. Well, it is in the literature, but it's not true. So we're dealing with a, a rigged science here. The randomized controlled trials are not really being allowed, and those case reports may reveal the utility of cannabis, but we're having trouble getting the information out there because we can't really do the studies that we would like to be doing. Uh, Markovic came out with a study just a couple years ago and they were saying, okay, if we're going to be looking at cannabis, we really have to look carefully at what, at what about uh, bias. And if somebody's coming out with a case report and says cannabis really works, they're going to say, well, that's biased. Uh, so there are 80 papers referenced here and it's a useful index. But it was really just kind of laying the groundwork. If we're going to study this, we really need to do it in a way that will reveal if there's bias in these studies, which sounds good, but generally, again, it's rigged against the cannabis. So what are we using the cannabis for? These are just a short list of the kinds of agitated behaviors that are very common in the, this dementia population with agitation, anxiety, psychosis, restlessness, loss of appetite, anger and aggression, depression, pain, spasms and insomnia, and many, many other symptoms. But these are the ones that we know cannabis works for these symptoms. So our task then is tailoring the treatment. What are we going to do? If you're trying to deal with, well, you saw earlier, if you're giving a milligram and a half of THC three times a day and it's not really doing anything, you're going to have to go up on dose. But what's interesting to me is, and I'm, I'm sure Dr. Grobel will concur, is that some people might get a great effect with maybe five milligrams of THC and five milligrams of CBD, but other people aren't going to really a, a realize a good benefit until they double that dose or even go higher and higher. So we do have some patients that may take as much as 25 or 30 milligrams of THC per dose and CBD per dose 
until and at which point they finally get good control. They calm down and these agitated behaviors will subside. So there may be a five to tenfold difference in the dosing from one person to the next. And to really do this correctly, you have to tailor the treatment. So if you're gonna do a fixed dose and say, okay, we're gonna give everybody five milligrams, you may find 20% of the population is gonna get a good, going to get a good benefit, but you also may find that the vast majority aren't really there yet. You need to tailor the dose in order to get the effect. This kind of breaks the style of a randomized controlled trial, in which case you give a fixed dose and see what the response is. For when treating with cannabis, we tailor the dose. We give more until we get the effect we're looking for. So these are just a list of some of those agitated behaviors. This comes from the Cohen-Mansfield Agitation Index. It would be a nice way to be monitoring our patients. This is our intention in monitoring patients with dementia and treating them with cannabinoids is to have the staff be able to record on a daily basis whether these agitated behaviors are improving under the influence of cannabis. Unfortunately, this takes a good bit of money and a good bit of staff. As you probably know, most facilities, whether we're talking about the hospital or a nursing facility, they're understaffed. They're already overworked. You might have a nurse on staff. Maybe they're not there all the time. You have a lot of caregivers there that are doing the best they can, but they're overworked. And they don't really have the time or the, or the responsibility or training to be able to keep track of all this data. So we're still trying to acquire the funding and, the, and the, set up the program to where we can actually monitor the benefits that we're getting from cannabis use because it's very real. And I personally, I don't know anybody who has gotten onto cannabis and not gotten a good effect when we tailor the dose for them. And I don't know of anybody who's had to discontinue the cannabis in this population because it doesn't work or they don't like it. It's just a matter of tailoring the dose and meeting the needs. So we have to choose the right patient, the right condition, the right dose, the right route of administration, the right timing, and the right ratios of cannabinoids. This gets complex. Patient selection, what we encourage the caregivers to do is, is call the doc and, and say, uh, well, actually before that, we need to have a conference with the families patients perhaps, the caregivers, and say, look, this is an option. If you're interested, we can proceed with this and be able to acquire the cannabis, help you to acquire it or have it delivered, bring it in and get the medicine for the patients. Uh, the nursing staff and the family uh, then will help the families get the medicine to the patient. And that's kind of the way it works. Any adult can get cannabis in California today. And then, as I was beginning to say last time, doctor, may I have an order for? Give one dose of cannabis medicine. Uh, in the case of uh, Primrose, that has been traditionally about 10 milligrams each of THC and CBD per dose. Now, the staff there knows that they may, this may be a dose that really is somnolent producing. They may sleep a bit for the first day or two. But rather than taking a very slow titration and going from a milligram to two to four to five to 10 and work up to a dose, they just start at 10 milligrams of each per dose. They give the dose until the patient will develop some tolerance to that dose. And then the behavior is, is improved and the agitation and the anxiety is much, much, much improved. So we just cut corners by treating people in an Alzheimer dementia facility by fixing the dose at 10 milligrams and then going from there if we need more. You could go down as well. I also like the idea of having an additional dose of cannabis for aggressive and combative behavior. If it gets to the point where you either need to call the psychiatrist or the physician on duty and say, we really need something now like an injection of Haldol to get control of these these very disruptive behaviors, dangerous behaviors, you could also use cannabis in many cases and give a big dose and knock them down. That's what big doses of cannabis will do. You'll go to sleep, brings you back home, a big dose and you'll sleep for a while. It's restorative in that way, but it also could, could mitigate these aggressive and agitated behaviors. 
So dosage range is quite a, there's quite a range, and I say here from two and a half milligrams of THC up to as much as 30 milligrams of THC per day. We've seen that in a few of the patients in the Alzheimer facility. And I think it's just a matter of observing, having good a recording in the chart as to what somebody needs, and then uh, uh, reacting accordingly. You could go down on dose if you find that the dose that you're continuing to use is just a little too much. You can go up or down from there. Oral formulations uh, work well. We do have a range of high THC and more balanced THC CBD products and high CBD products. In my experience, the high CBD products can be useful for, ed for anxiety, but in terms of uh, dementia, I really think that getting some THC in there in more of a balanced ratio with the CBD is a much more effective medicine. Residential care facility, this is a, a case report, and it's a fairly recent uh, report of DW, who is 74 years old, kind of a young man with, with dementia, 10-year progression of his disease. The family decided that they could no longer take care of the patient. It was just getting to be too much with the confusion and the behavior and the hygiene, and you know the stories. And finally, they brought him into the center. Was, he was yelling and waking up everybody, not only at home, but yelling in the facility where he was placed. So we started him on a 10 milligram dose of THC and CBD, and over the course of a, a very short number of days, this came under control and he is no longer doing this. So he's resting better and is happier and more comfortable. The family's more comfortable, the staff's more comfortable. It just has worked well. And this is a common report. So I want to briefly review some history and physiology. You, you know, I, I'm not going to test you on this information, so just enjoy some interesting pictures. Cannabis has been around for ages. These uh, centers in, uh, in Asia date back two, five, ten thousand years over here in, in uh, Japan, over ten thousand years with evidence in their archaeologic sites of cannabis being part of these cultures. Similarly, in Europe, we have sites that are, go back five and 10,000 years in many, many places. So cannabis has been with us. We've been using it as not only for fiber and for food, but for medicine for thousands and thousands of years. To act like it's a new drug or it's a dangerous drug is just propaganda. Cannabis for fodder, yeah, we turn the animals loose in many places in the world to eat the cannabis. It's good food for them as well, rich in proteins and, and essential oils. For fiber, I love this picture. This is typical to have like 10, 15 feet plants that grow in a season. Vast amounts of fibers, great for replacing uh, wood and trees in our, in our use of paper. And then this is out of Oregon last year. CBD growing in Oregon, big fields. They've got a lot of it growing up there. So the biggest problem is just in harvesting. It gums up the combines and they haven't quite figured that out yet. It's so sticky. All animals, perhaps excepting, in, excepting insects, have the endocannabinoid system. We see it in the genes, all the way down to the hydra and the sea squirts over here on the left. They've got an endocannabinoid system. It helps bring them back into balance with eating and resting at the, as needed in order to help their health. And of course, throughout the animal kingdom. The cannabinoid receptors, of course, are concentrated in those areas of the brain, the hippocampus, the amygdala, and so forth, where we know it is responsible for certain aspects of, of mental function. Throughout the rest of the body, you can see how this dappling in the, in the uh, lymphatics around the body, but also the liver, the spleen, the gut, the pelvic organs, and so forth, all are rich in CB2 receptors. These are also a mobile pool of cannabinoids that go out, circulate in the body and the bloodstream as monocytes, macrophages, T cells, B cells, these circulating cells in the body are out looking for trouble. They're responsible for neural protection. They're responsible for killing cancer cells. 
this kind of sum, summarizes what's happening in terms of the regulation of the neural uh, transmission. You've probably seen this before. In this case, glutamate is the neurotransmitter, as it might be with any number of other cannabinoids. I'm sorry, I, any other number of neurotransmitters, adrenaline, serotonin, dopamine, it all works the same way. The cannabinoids, the natural ones, are produced on the postsynaptic cell. They cross the cleft to the, to the cannabinoid receptor that you saw in those previous pictures. Activating the CB1 receptor stops the production and the release of the neurotransmitter. So it modulates the way that the nerves work. It basically protects the nerves from excitotoxicity. Papers are written about this. If you overstimulate a nerve over and over and over, you'll kill the nerve. So the cannabinoids are there for neuroprotection. They protect the nerves from excessive activity that may actually kill the nerve. This is a look at that receptor that we're talking about. The CB1 is the green, I'm sorry, the blue chain of amino acids, and the green chain of amino acids is the one in the CB2 receptors. They match up where the dots are next to one another. One change in that amino acid sequence and the receptor doesn't work as well. And when we look at the genes making these proteins, we can see that humans are not the same in making these receptors. There's quite a range of little polymorphisms, differences in the form of these receptors to where they don't all work the same. And this has led to our understanding of endocannabinoid deficiency syndromes, which are listed here in these two pages. If you look at patients with these problems, they have similar cannabinoid receptor genes. So they cluster into these different conditions. And we'll, we'll find more. This is a growing list. It was one page about a year ago. It's two pages now. So what we're seeing is this list and, and this second page, seizure disorders, even happiness is, a, is an endocannabinoid difference. I wouldn't call it a deficiency. I, I like that one. <laughs> Depression. A lot of the mood disorders, this may be inherited by way of our cannabinoid receptors. They're not the same from person to person. So augmenting this natural system does bring relief in all of these conditions. So we've got this treasure trove of molecules in the cannabis plant, and I want to address some of what it can do. This is just a list of some of the physiologic things that we know cannabinoids do. It's a long list, and among them for our today's talk, we've got the anti-inflammatory role cited up here. It's also pain relieving. Uh, it has a, a nice list, antipsychotic, anti-anxiolytic, antidepressant, and so forth. So there are a lot of physiologic events that occur in response to activating the cannabinoid system. By the way, THC activates those cannabinoid receptors directly. CBD does not. It's an indirect effect. And it, in, it works out that when both CBD and THC are there together, we get kind of a stronger synergy of these two molecules working together. This is just a brief statement that came out of the NIH where you would maybe not expect to see this, but they're not talking about pot. They're not talking about cannabis here. They're talking about cannabinoids. As if, as if it were something that would be brought to you by the, your pharmaceutical industry. So they're saying that modulating endocannabinoid activity may have therapeutic potential in almost all diseases affecting humans. Those are big words coming out of the NIH. Moving along though, this is rank order of the kinds of patients I'm treating in my practice. Still pain probably leads the way. A lot more cancers. I've gone from about 8% cancers a few years ago to probably 30 or 35% of my patients are now t dealing with cancers. And dementia has come up from being rather low on the list a few years ago. It's right up there uh, among some of the more uh, commonly uh, presenting patient problems. So we're here then to optimize our tr use of cannabis to treat these conditions understanding the variables that can't be controlled and adjusting the variables that cannot be controlled. So the ones that we can't control start right here. This is the metabolism through our liver. The natural cannabinoids are broken 
down on site right at those nerve endings that I was talking about a minute ago. But the plant cannabinoids are broken down in the liver and everybody's liver is a little bit different. We have these various enzyme pathways called the cytochrome P450 enzyme pathways and THC and CBD and CBN are metabolized by several of them and in many cases they're overlapping. These also are the same enzyme systems that may be responsible for common drug usage metabolism. So we have to be watching for drug-drug interactions. And overall, I would say there's no significant drug-drug interaction between cannabis and other conventional drugs. Not that they may not share the same enzyme system, but the enzyme systems are sufficiently active to be able to break down common drugs and cannabis without worry. The exception being high doses of CBD and a drug called Clobazam, which makes a uh, a metabolite that is very somnolent inducing. So if people are on anti-epileptic drugs and on high dose cannabis, you should be checking their anti-epileptic drug levels. It just makes sense to be looking. Metabolism also affects the way that these drugs are gonna show up in the bloodstream. This is for smoked or vaporized cannabis. So we've got here smoked cannabis, when you smoke here at zero minutes, here's your time scale, here's your blood levels. We get a nice peak in about five to 10 minutes and then over the first hour, most of it's gone. By three hours, it's out of your system. Active ingredients are metabolized. The inactive ones are great for law enforcement because they last for days. Otherwise, they're no use to us. The solid line is what the THC turned into and it's not pharmacologically active after a few hours. The ingested forms are quite a different curve. First of all, they take about a half hour before they show up at all. So it takes maybe 45 minutes before you're really seeing these active ingredients come up on your graph here. The inactive ones broken down by the liver are the solid lines. So the THC that was ingested in this case is broken down into the act inactive components, which accounts for about 80 or 90 percent of the oral dose. And the other 10 or 20 percent are these curves here. This is what we're using as far as our pharmacologic effect. It peaks between one and three or four hours and then tapers off for eight or 10 hours or five to 10 hours. Some people are rapid metabolizers, some people are, are very slow metabolizers. So if somebody uses a dose at bedtime and say, oh, I'm still feeling it the next morning, I'm gonna say, okay, either take it earlier at night or you're just gonna have to get used to it. After some time of using it, you will develop tolerance. But the idea being, you, we need to, again, tailor the dose to the effect on any one individual. And you might find that one or two doses a day is sufficient. In other cases, you might use three or four doses a day if they're a rapid metabolizer. And if you're smoking cannabis, again, per this graph here, you may use cannabis every, every few hours. And some people use it that way, and you would not know them in our society. People can toke on a vapor pen or a, or a pipe and you just wouldn't recognize that they're under the influence because they've gotten very tolerant of it. And unless you could smell it on somebody, you're not gonna know they're using it, which is interesting in that I've had a practice now for 20 years in Sebastopol. I've got superior court justices, doctors, lawyers, all kinds of professionals on into the, the workforce of our society you would not know that these people are using cannabis unless they were to reveal that to you. So going on then, we're looking at the method of administration, the frequency of dosing, the THC-CBD ratio, which I'll break down a little bit, and then the acid forms of cannabinoids, which are also interesting molecules. You probably know that the plant has the acid forms when it's green. When it's dried, it decarboxylates. I'll get to this in a minute. But the other things here are the frequency, the ratio, the THC, and other therapeutic considerations. Smoke is, has a bioavailability or vapor up to over 50%. So it really depends on how you're using it. If you're taking a puff casually, you're not really absorbing much. If you're taking it in and holding it in your lungs, 
waiting for a few, you know, several seconds, you're going to get more across that alveolar border into the bloodstream. So the range is quite dramatic from as little as 2% to as much as 56% is absorbed. In another study, it was 10 to 25% and so forth. The oral forms, again, only 10 to 20% in one study, 4 to 20% in another, 6% in another. These are rather low percentages of active ingredients that end up in the bloodstream doing the work that we're looking for. For uh, suppositories, we, I'll bring this back up when I speak to, about suppositories in a few more minutes, but we don't really know how well they're absorbed. What patients say is, I don't feel it. What that means to me is, we're not getting much THC into the bloodstream through a suppository. I would say about one out of 20 people will tell me, oh, I used a suppository and had to crawl around for a few hours because I was knocked down by it. Most people don't get that response. The majority of people do not really feel the suppositories. Clinically, I hear a lot of different reports about, oh, it helps me with. And so there are a lot of anecdotes to suggest that we do get some absorption. We just haven't run the tests on cannabis, on full plant cannabis oil to see what and how much gets absorbed. We know that from studies done almost 20 years ago, that THC is not absorbed as a single molecule from a suppository into the animal models, monkeys and dogs. It wasn't absorbed at all. We don't know how that would change if you're using a whole plant extract, which has terpenes and other cannabinoids. These oily substances may facilitate absorption. So we need those, uh, that scientific evidence to know what we're doing with suppositories. Topical use is excellent, and I'll speak to this again in a minute. Some people get a great benefit with putting it on painful limbs and joints, rubbing it on, and in many cases it works very well. In others, people just don't get the relief and they have to use oral or inhaled forms. Transdermal is another beast of its own. Now you're taking the cannabis, instead of rubbing on the skin to getting an effect on those nerves near the area of your problem, you're counting on vehicles to get it through to your bloodstream and using it like many of the patches are designed today, which are transdermal rather than topical. So it's a different medicine and is being developed, but I wouldn't say that the products are particularly good at this point. Smoke and vapor, this is the most common delivery system. I wouldn't rule it out for patients with dementia. I do have people with mild to moderate forms of dementia and they have loved using cannabis. You give them a vaporizer to self-medicate and they're happy with that. So I wouldn't rule it out. Commonly in a nursing facility, you're gonna give an oral dose on a fixed basis. But for some people, you may very well do best by letting people self-administer. At worst, they may fall asleep. Vaporizing uh, is, a, I would have to say, a safer way to use it. It's less irritating to the airway. Uh, of course, smoke, by burning it, we've got pyrolytic compounds, which in themselves may be carcinogens, but the cannabinoids are working to kill off cancer cells. So the net effect is that we don't see any increase in, the, in any of the serious pulmonary diseases. Uh, peak concentrations when smoking or vaporizing, about 10 minutes. Strongest effects for 30 to 60 minutes. Duration of action, two to three hours. Uh, it does avoid that first pass metabolism. So you ingest it orally, it's gonna go to the portal vein and into the liver and be broken down before it gets into the bloodstream. Whereas when we're inhaling it, it's getting directly into the bloodstream. Doesn't last as long in the system, but it gets directly in without getting broken down first. That's why we can get over 50% absorption into the bloodstream from inhaled uh, methods. Bioavailability ranges from two to 56% as mentioned. So there is a difficult question that physicians have a tough time with, and that's condoning the use of smoked cannabis as a medicine. It, well, I think it's a reasonable method of administration. People use it all the time. If it's a matter of somebody 
lighting a pipe and they have serious physical and mental problems, that may not be the best method of administration. But for people that can handle a vapor pen, it is reasonable. Uh, so again, uh, I think that we have to respect that patients make their personal decision. After 20 years in this, in this uh, business, I have found that, thank you, aye, aye, aye. I have found that people um, still prefer smoked cannabis over any other method of administration. The majority of my patients after all these years prefer smoking. Uh, I would say that is gradually changing. More and more people are using cannabis orally, maybe at bedtime, maybe, it just depends on their medical situation. Oral products, uh, I won't say a lot about these because it kind of goes with the territory. We use them all the time. There's a vast range of products. Uh, they appear in the bloodstream after about a half hour, which I said already, the peak blood levels are one to three or four hours, the duration of action five to eight hours or longer. So two or three time a day administration is usually quite sufficient. The ratio of THC to 11 hydroxy THC, I'm gonna leave that behind. Suffice to say 11 hydroxy is the first metabolite of THC in the liver is quite psychoactive in itself. And it is, by the time it gets through the liver into the bloodstream, 80% of the THC is already broken down to this 11 hydroxy THC. Suppositories I have mentioned, I just want to note here that the government has looked into suppositories about 20 years ago when that data came out saying THC was not absorbed. They crafted some molecules with THC and the one that was best absorbed was called THC hemisuccinate. It's a compound, it's a pro-drug if you will. You put it into a suppository, it gets absorbed quite nicely. Uh, it said that 67% uh, of it got absorbed in the animal models through the suppository as a hemisuccinate molecule. Well, the issue then is this is a bit misleading because no one is making hemisuccinate suppositories. We don't have any of these in the marketplace. So to say in a government-funded research that oral absorb, I'm sorry, suppositories are twice the bioavailability as the oral form is a little disingenuous because nobody is making a product that works like this. So take it for what it's worth. Um, we do use the full cannabis extracts in suppositories. You can get huge doses, but exactly how much gets absorbed is uncertain. Topicals, give them a try. If people have limb pains, leg pains, neuropathy, other problems, they may benefit quite well from topicals. This came out of the PMC. These are Physicians for Medical Cannabis in, in um, Canada. And in a post just a couple months ago, one after another, these elderly local residents described how cannabis topicals have helped with their arthritis pain. They report no systemic side effects or problems. Many report that cannabis topicals have helped them get back to exercise and activity. The island it, this is Vancouver Island, is, has a well-known rose uh, grower who is almost 90. She was able to return to rose gardening after reduction of swelling and pain in the joints of her hands, rubbing on the topicals on a regular basis. And a gentleman in his 80s was able to return to cycling after a reduction of knee pain and swelling. So certainly give topicals a try if that's, if that's one of the things that you're trying to treat. Here's the difference between topicals and transdermals. I think I've explained this a bit already, but topicals date back centuries, actually millennia. Uh, transdermals are still under development, and I think there's a place for them in the future, but I don't think they're so effective at this point to get the, the cannabis through the skin into the systemic circulation. So again, we're talking about methods of administration, dosage, THC CBD ratios, acid cannabinoids, and other therapeutic considerations. And our job is to tailor the dosage to meet the needs. And so a dose may range for as little as a one milligram, which I think is like a, a, a one milligram is more of a homeopathic dose, let me put it that way. You've usually got to get up to five milligrams or so before you really feel a, a significant effect or more in some 
cases. It's okay to take a medication holiday. If you're using cannabis on a regular basis and for whatever reason you forgot, you're traveling, you wanna be really bright when you're talking to your accountant, you can take a holiday and skip the dose and then get right back to it. There's no significant withdrawal. Uh, the THC CBD ratio, the higher you go on the CBD, the, the less psychoactivity. So this is a nice way to deal with that is just to go up on CBD. Uh, the acid forms are useful molecules. It's said now that we have somewhere around 100 to 144 cannabinoids in cannabis. Type 1 cannabis is marijuana, uh, somewhere around 100 to 1 THC to CBD. Type 2s are those that are more or less balanced in THC, CBD. Those are cultivars that are rich in CBD. The type 3s are almost, you know, predominantly CBD, 20 to 1, 30 to 1. So you can get very high CBDs. Sometimes that's just where you start. People will come in and say, I don't want to get high. Okay, we'll start with a high CBD, but I may caution them. They may need something with a little more THC to get a, a proper effect. As I mentioned, 144, uh, up to 144 different cannabinoids are seen in cannabis. If you count that many, you gotta double it when you have these acid forms of cannabis because they're different molecules. They don't work the same as the, the decarboxylated forms. So we have a lot of choices and you'll see products that are THCA and CBDA. You can give them a try. I think that using the decarboxylated ones are probably much more common usage and we know a lot more about them in research, but the acid forms are valuable and if we're treating seizure disorders or other conditions, we may really push to use acid cannabinoids in order to see if we can get control. Um, here's the green plant with its acids. There it is. That's the acid moiety on THCA. When it's heated, the carbon dioxide comes off and now we've got THC. So if you've got a bottle of THCA tincture and you leave it on the dashboard of your car and it gets hot, it may decarboxylate. It's a, it's a bit of a fragile molecule. Other therapeutic considerations, cannabis is an adaptogen. It may improve your appetite, but if you've had a meal and you use cannabis, it's not gonna send you back to the kitchen. It could. If you've already slept the night and you use cannabis in the morning, it's not going to put you back in bed again, in most cases. It's dose dependent too. Tolerance is our friend. It's very useful. And I'm not going to have much time to talk about uh, synergy and plant versus whole plant versus single molecules, but maybe we'll touch on it in the remaining minutes. This is taking THC and killing cancer cells. This is taking CBD and killing cancer cells. Then you take the same doses that you use to suppress the growth of these cancer cells, put them together, and there's the synergy down here. They work much better together than they do along, and this is not only true for killing cancer cells, this is true in dealing with most medical problems. This is the difference between CBD and CBD as a whole plant extract. They're not the same. When people say, well, I'm gonna go on the internet and shop for CBD, well, fine, but it's not the same. A whole plant extract works much differently than does a single molecule CBD. So what we're showing here is two graphs on the left side that are single molecule CBD. And in the case of this experimental design, they burned the paw of an animal. It had diminished swelling, paw thickness, up to a point, and you give a bigger dose of single molecule CBD, and it reverses and goes the other way again. Similarly, with pain control, we get a benefit on pain control, and then as we go up on dose, it disappears again. So single molecule CBD has a biphasic response. It works nicely at a certain dose, but it's hard to tell where that dose is. We're much better off with whole plant CBD that we see here. The bigger the dose, the less swelling. The bigger the dose, the better pain control. And then moving along, tolerance is something we need to teach patients about. If they get high today and then they stay on the same dose, that tolerance is gonna develop and they're gonna be able to handle it. So coach people about 
bearing with it. What they feel the first day or two or night or two or three may dissipate and disappear after a week's treatment. Uh, the relevance of the minor cannabinoids, this is very interesting to me right here. This is a compound on the left that worked for treating autism in Israel. The compound on the right didn't work, and they discovered that accidentally when they switched from compound 266 to compound 267. They were the same in CBD and THC. So you would have expected them to work well for, for dementia. And they, the second one did not. They had to go back to the original strain, and then everybody came under control again. I'm sorry, this wasn't for dementia, this was for autism. Agitation, aggressive behavior, violence, and it disappeared. And so they went back to the original strain and they all came under control. This is also true in killing cancer cells. High THC, high CBD killed those cancers, but not prostate cancers. Another extract didn't kill colon and breast cancer, but did kill prostate cancer. And what we have found out in Israel is that this one circled in red was that minor cannabinoid that when it was there was, uh, was able to kill those other cancer cells. So this is something that is just at the forefront of our education now. We're studying this more. We're going to be able to advise people as to best strains for cancer in the future. I do have another case report. I think I'm going to just leave it here on the board and finish up because um, I am out of time. Suffice to say that this uh, patient in a, in a facility was, a, was a, um, an alpha male who was a retired law enforcement officer, started into 1010 THC CBD and did very well. And we just see this over and over again. Cannabis is the drug of choice for treating dementia. I would use it before I would use any of those other molecules that I spoke of earlier. If they're already on them, get established on cannabis. Diminish those drugs after you do. You'll find that you can often uh, get rid of almost all of those other drugs uh, as you uh, get familiar with cannabis. I do want to welcome you to enjoy this journal that our, org that our, our physician organization is responsible for. It's in your bag. Uh, we have uh, a table set up over here, and I welcome your coming around and and signing up to become a member of the Society of Cannabis Clinicians. You don't have to be a physician to join. So thank you very much for your attention. Really appreciate the invitation.